I'm here with the co-chairs of Working Group 4, uh, Professor Ian Chappell and Professor David Herrera. Uh, and your group has been discussing uh, educational methods. So I suppose to start with Ian, it's a very vast area with many different types of learners of different ages. So how did you control your remit for what to discuss this week? A good question. We started with a diagram, a matrix diagram, that sort of defined the types of learning, face-to-face -face learning, then virtual learning, and then essentially looking at um, combining those and comparing and contrasting those in a blended learning approach. We looked at undergraduate levels, we looked at postgraduate levels that lead to specialist training, and then at what we term CPD. And then there were various aspects such as the, the teaching itself, the learning, the assessment, uh, and they were encompassed in a diagram. And we used that diagram as the basis then for designing the, uh, the manuscripts and also the, the questions that we were answering on the basis of those technical reviews. Okay, so that probably led you into that structured approach into considering different methods. Maybe some that we've discussed before and are in our previous guidelines and some new ones. So were there any new approaches that um, as a group you felt could help to move dental education forward? Well, we started our evaluation from the traditional face-to-face -face and, 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 and then realized which was the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and how face-to-face, -face, traditional face-to-face, -face was adapted to become virtual classrooms. And already we learned a lot of things because virtual class classrooms is, is, is an advance, it's something that was done before. But we also realized that you need to combine or it's better to combine this virtual classroom with other advanced methodologies centered around the students as the typical a problem-based learning. So face-to-face -face still has room with or in or outside the virtual classrooms. But then we have explored this new world of the virtual methodologies, a very attractive world full of uh, very interesting areas like simulation or artificial intelligence. And of course, this, this, this could both could be combined and is within blended learning. We have seen the potential of, of all these technologies, but at the same time, we have also discussed the limitations because some of these approaches may be very expensive. And we don't have the evidence to support that they are efficacious, at least yet. So we are cautious in the approach or we, we, have, we need to analyze many different factors. But what is clear as w when we compare what we have now to what we have 15 years ago is that we have multiple op options. We have many different approaches that we can follow and that I think it is very good. Okay. Yeah, You've touched on it uh, uh, to some extent already but the opportunities and the challenges then from purely looking at a, a digital perspective are there any concerns about it going forward or any particular areas we should embrace? There are many concerns. I mean, as, as David has said, the opportunities are huge, but you need to have access to expensive technology. Haptics, for example, um, they're not cheap. So that might, may limit the generalizability of these methods. Um, internet access is not necessarily available to every individual student. Uh, so there are many challenges and, and, and as David indicated, the research evidence base is not as strong as we would like. The bulk of the evidence we found was actually for the undergraduate level and it, that doesn't necessarily map to the postgraduate level or the CPD level. But what was interesting was, you know, accepting all of these fantastic technologies, um, the students still felt that face-to-face -face learning was the best because they can interact, they can question the presenter, they can have the peer interactions, they can have peer-to-peer -peer learning. There are a whole host of almost subliminal or, or unrecognized uh, activities that happen in that face-to-face -face environment that they missed when everything moved online. So I think what's become clear from, from the workshop is that face-to-face has an important future and, it, and is valued both by the students at all levels 
and also by uh, their, their tutors. And it's a case of how you augment that with the various different options uh, in terms of the digital, the, the virtual technologies that are available. But you have to take into account the cost. And you also have to take into account student well-being. Student well-being is often ignored. And one of the big areas that we found was, was a real concern was what we call asynchronous learning. It's not live learning, it's additional material given to the students. Quite often it's not timetabled into their working week. And there is an expectation that they will just do it. And so that can extend the working week and it can have big consequences on student, men, students' mental health and well-being. And I think that that is something that we need more research on. Okay. Um, naturally feeds in, I guess, to what you were touching on, the concept of blending the learning. I know that's not inherently a new concept, but maybe something that has become a bit more formalized uh, in recent years. So, as you've touched on, Ian, a lot of the research is from an undergraduate level. Do you see differences in how we might be able to employ things like blended learning, depending on the, the level of experience or the stage of learning of, of our learners? Yeah. This is a very good question because we understand now in, in, in 2024 that we have different resources and that virtual classrooms and virtual learning is here to be used. But it is true that, we, that how we implement this at the different levels of education and even within the same level at the different subjects, depending on the competences and learning outcomes that has been predefined, will be completely different. And I give you two examples. So undergraduate education benefits a lot from the face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. as Ian was saying. The students need to have interactions with their peers and with the professors. And, but you can use also virtual tools and most often in the first years than in the last years in which most of the uh, subjects will focus on skills. Look now at the continual professional development or continu continuing education. Now we, is somebody who is already in the private practice or at least he or she is working and he cannot leave his, uh, his or her job for two years or for six months to join a program. But if it's blended, it may be keeping the normal life from Monday to Thursday and then Friday and Saturday he or she can attend some courses. So it's a completely different scenario what you can have for a professional as compared with an undergraduate student. And again, with this vast variety of options that we have available, you can design and customize your program or your subject according to all these factors. And we have identified during the workshop that the factors are not just the year or the level of education or the learning outcomes. Also, country, cultural factors yeah. are affecting these decisions. So we need to, taking all these factors into account, we may be able to, fi to find or identify the optimal balance within the blended lear learning how much face-to-face, -face, how much virtual components. Okay, so I guess the two of you have been at the forefront in dental education for many years and still young guys, so lots of excitement I can see going forward. But I can see the challenges from how much ground we've covered in this discussion. As, as I sense kind of excitement for you, from you both about the future, um, what do you think we can take forward as kind of exciting concepts for perio education in the future from this? I look, this one conclusion that surprised all of us, all of us, but it was a very consistent uh, conclusion of the review by Bruno Loss and co-workers. The role of the professor and how uh, he, his involvement, his involvement in the teaching is crucial, is central to the virtual or to the face-to-face -face components. So we, in our conclusions, we strongly suggest that training the trainers is, is, it has been always very important. But now, with the new technologies and the new methodologies, it is even more important. So we have a lot of student-centered mm -hmm. uh, methodologies, but always how much uh, the, the professor is involved is 
key for the success. Well, and also, I, I mean, that's absolutely right, but also critical, and this came out actually in some of the research studies, is that the teacher is inspiring and engaging. And sometimes that's innate. Some people just have it, and other people definitely don't have it. And the training that David's referring to um, is actually almost mandatory uh, in some higher education institutions. And this was one of the debates we had, is about you know, the courses for training the trainer, and do they themselves go through certificates and diplomas and actually masters uh, so that they can address areas that they may be weaker in, that they're not naturally, have a natural flair for. Because the biggest impact in terms of achieving the learning outcomes for any education program is, as David said, it's the quality of the trainer and, and, and the educator. So we've talked about the personal touch of educators and their interaction with their learners, but while none of us is robots, AI is very topical at the present. So is that something you considered and how do you think it can impact? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hot topic and it was uh, considered among the methodologies for vir virtual uh, methods. Well, it is a very hot topic. It is going to have a huge impact on the education in general and specifically in dentistry and periodontology. The suggestion for now according to the information that we have, is to have a cautious approach. The use may help us a lot, but in teaching is what the experience that we have so far are not very positive, and we need to be very cautious in how we use artificial intelligence. So it's going to be a very important tool, hopefully an adjunctive tool, and this is something that we highlight in, in the consensus report, we cannot deny that it's going to change many things, but we don't know exactly how, and for the time being, being co cautious is the recommendation of the consensus report. Yeah, I mean, there are risks, and, and what David's referring to really are some of the risks that we identified. So, you know, artificial intelligence can be incredibly valuable in radiological diagnosis or in the diagnosis of tumours or whatever it may be, but there is a risk that it could lead to over-treatment, or under treatment. So the accuracy will need to be very, very carefully validated. And ultimately, it's probably going to be a tool, but the decision is ultimately made by the human being with the knowledge from the AI rather than purely the AI making the decisions. I think that is a real risk. And we, we looked at those risks and, and also the risks in term, with AI in terms of uh, confidentiality uh, is, is another issue and data protection. Okay, so I can see clear implications for learners, uh, for educators and for curricula in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Peter. Pleasure.